So listen for the word of God in Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through town. A man there named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay at your home today. So Zacchaeus came down, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and, I will, and, I, and, I will, uh, and if I have cheated anyone, I will repay them four times as much. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this household, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the human one came to seek and save the lost. The word of God. Please be seated again. <laughs> You all are very familiar with this story. Most of you are familiar with this story. Zacchaeus was a, and a wee little man was, he climbed up into a tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked into the tree and he said, For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your And praise, you always need to do it three times. For I'm going to your house today. Familiar story to us. There are two ways of seeing this story. There is the traditional interpretation of the story of Zacchaeus, and there's perhaps a fresh way of looking at the story. First, let's start with the traditional story. Zacchaeus is a sinner who needs to repent. That's the first way of seeing the story. The story of Zacchaeus occurs only in the Gospel of Luke. It comes at the end of Luke's travel narrative that begins all the way back in chapter 9 in Galilee, where it says, when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And then Luke repeats himself at least eight times again uh, in this narrative, saying that Jesus is headed for Jerusalem. The journey ends when Jesus enters Jerusalem, where Luke says that every day he was teaching in the temple. And so the first way of seeing this story is the traditional, classical repentance story. There's a sinner who's sinful, needs repenting, repents, and becomes saved. Luke describes him as a sort of sleazeball person that we love to hate. He says that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. Uh, that is, he was the Jew who collected taxes for the Roman oppressors from the Jewish people. So he was a traitor to the political cause. Luke also says that Zacchaeus was wealthy. And surprise, surprise, how did the Roman tax collector get wealthy? By extortion and embezzlement. By taking advantage of the elderly. By exploiting the working poor and by taking care of his cronies. There's an unspoken assumption of corruption here about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a man who deserves our disdain in the traditional way of looking at the story. Zacchaeus was not only corrupt and rich, he was short. Ableism. When Jesus passed through Jericho, he was eager to get a look, so he did something utterly undignified for a man of his stature and station. He ran ahead of the cl crowd, climbed into the tree, then waited for Jesus to pass by. Imagine a powerful lobbyist in Washington doing something similar during the presidential parade. I actually may watch it. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up, saw Zacchaeus, and told him, you come down, and then invited him. In fact, in the Greek, this is not a calm, easy invitation. It is, in fact, a, the command. I must stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house, and Zacchaeus climbs down, and thankfully, he welcomed Jesus gladly. 
The response of the crowd, of course, in the Gospel of Luke is predictable. Luke says that, quote, they began to murmur. He has gone to a house of a sinner. Luke has returned to one of the major themes in his gospel that Jesus welcomes sinners. The same theme that was the occasion of his three earlier stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost prodigal son. Indeed, the son of man or the human one has come to save and seek who is lost. And so Zacchaeus defends himself before this hostile crowd. He says, I'll give I will give half of my possessions to the poor and, and I will repay fourfold all the people if I've cheated them. That would be a long list of angry taxpayers. When we read the traditional story this way, Zacchaeus is a sinner in need of repentance and he's converted on the spot and he promises future actions or future reparations for what he has done wrong. But, there is a second way of reading the story of Zacchaeus, which I'm really excited to share with you. Because as is often the case with Jesus, our Jesus, he messes with our assumptions about saints and sinners. And the story of Zacchaeus does exactly that. It questions our assumptions about who are saints and who are sinners. So rather than seeing Zacchaeus as a sinner in the traditional sense, who needs to repent, we can read the story of Zacchaeus as a story of a saint who surprises. Not a sinner who repents, but a saint who, rep who surprises. You see, the name Zacchaeus means to be pure or righteous. Which is kind of an irony in this story, would you not think? Zacchaeus' name means to be pure, to be righteous. And in this reading of the story of Zacchaeus, in fact, he is righteous and pure. He doesn't make promises about the future. Rather, he defends himself to the shocked crowd who are appalled by his behavior. He defends himself by his past actions. So both interpretations of the story of Zacchaeus, the traditional one that's a sinner in need of repentance, and the fresh interpretation that it is a saint who surprises, both of them depend on how you translate Luke chapter 19, verse 8. And in particular, the verbs in the Greek text that are present tense. It's a good example of the interplay between translation and interpretation, which we do all the time. So... Here, look at the screen. Here is the traditional way of viewing this passage, where it includes the future. Some Bible translations, the NRSV, NIV, among others, translate Luke 19, verse 8 as follows. Look, Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I cheated anyone, I will repay them four times that much. Even though the verbs in the Greek are in the present tense, this is typically how most translations translate the Greek. They render the present tense verbs as futuristic presents. I will repay. I will give. That is, Zacchaeus, the sinner, repents and vows from this point forward to change his behavior. Everybody still with me? I will give. I will repay. But the second option for the reading of the story follows the translations according to the King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, the Common English Bible. They render the verb as progressive present tense, which it is. In this reading, Zacchaeus is a hidden saint about whom people have made up all sorts of false assumptions about his corruption and treats him accordingly. So if you look at the next slide, you will see that this is how Luke 19 verse 8, I believe, should be translated. Look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated everyone, I repay them four times as much. Do you see the difference? One is a, a sinner in need of repentance. I will do this in the future. The other is a saint that surprises us. The crowd, you see, has demonized Zacchaeus. But Jesus praises him as a son of Abraham. Amen? 
you're all scratching your heads because we didn't grow up with this kind of story. I like the second reading. It fits with the many times that Jesus calls out good people who are in fact bad and praises so-called bad people who are in fact good. Amen? Friends, shall we stand again? Hey, this fits. I'll read it again with the many times Jesus calls out good people who are bad and praises so-called bad people who are good. Luke has already mentioned several unlikely heroes in his gospel. The faith of a Roman soldier, a good Samaritan, a shrewd manager who was commended for his dishonesty, a Samaritan um, leper who was, uh, who was the only one to give thanks to Jesus for his healing, a tax collector, a tax collector. Jesus commended all these ones as righteous. So maybe the story of Zacchaeus is not about a sinner who shocks us by repenting. <gasps> no, maybe it is about a crowd that demonizes a person it doesn't like with all sorts of false assumptions and excludes them from uplifting social interactions called community or any social interactions. Theologian Elizabeth Caton notes several ironies in this interpretation. The despicable Zacchaeus is in fact a generous one. The traditional interpretation of Zacchaeus is a sinner who is converted, she says, tricks us into committing the very sin that the story condemns. It presents Zacchaeus not as a righteous and generous man who is wrongly scorned by his prejudiced neighbors, but a story of a penitent sinner. Turns out, she goes on to say, Zacchaeus does actually live up to his name. He is in fact the righteous one. Turns out Jesus knew that all along. And here is a quote that she ends uh, her statement with. Jesus is once again turning our world upside down, confronting us with all our assumptions about who is good and who is evil, and demonstrating for us the tricks we play in our minds before we treat one another one way or another. Like the crowd murmuring about Zacchaeus, it is easy to be blinded by our prejudices of those people and find ourselves accusing the very person or people we should be emulating. Read this way, what do we say about this story? Rather than imagining it as a perfect conversion story, one we should turn to, to emulate, particularly the giving pa part, <laughs> we might simply take it yet as one more example where Jesus does the unexpected. Notice that Jesus calls this chief tax collector by name. Zacchaeus, you come down. There is both intentionality and urgency in Jesus' invitation. From the outset of Luke's gospel and throughout the entire story, Jesus sides with those on the margin, with those considered down and out, those not accounted as much in the eyes of the world. While Zacchaeus is rich, he is nevertheless despised by his neighbor, counted as nothing or even worse than nothing, yet Jesus singles him out. Why? Might he know that Zacchae, of, about Zacchaeus' uh, exemplary behavior? We don't know. Yet, by seeing him, calling him, staying with him, and blessing with him, Jesus declares for all to hear that this one, even the chief tax collector, is a child of God, a child of Abraham. Perhaps Jesus is again at work seeking out those who are lost, in order to find, save, and restore them. Or perhaps, or perhaps Zacchaeus serves as yet further evidence of the endless possibilities present in Jesus' presence. So far, almost everything about this story seems impossible. That a chief collector, tax collector, would want to see Jesus. That Jesus would want to stay in his home. Uh, that it would be revealed that this sinner exceeded the law by his generosity. That Jesus would declare not just him, but the whole household saved. Yet just earlier in chapter 18, Jesus declared that what is impossible for mortals is nevertheless possible for God. What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. 
And so perhaps Zacchaeus in this story is one more example of the impossible possibility that Jesus embodies and manifests in uplifting social interactions. Or perhaps Zacchaeus simply represents the, the chief attribute of a disciple, a desire to see Jesus and corresponding joy in Jesus' presence. Zacchaeus cannot see Jesus because he's too short, both physically and probably morally in the crowd's eyes, and so the crowd blocks his sight. But yet this chief tax collector is so desperate to see Jesus that he will not be deterred and humiliates himself by climbing in the tree like a young child in order to get a glimpse over the crowd to see Jesus. There is one way of reading this story, but a fresh way of reading this story The story is not about formulas regarding repentance and forgiveness. No, it is a call, it calls into question any attempts to reduce the miracle of salvation to, to a single formula. No, no, no. This story rather embodies the promise that anyone, anyone who desires to see Jesus will. More than that, anyone who desires to see Jesus in turn be seen by Jesus and this way have their joy be made complete. Amen? If we can imagine reading the story of Zacchaeus along these lines, a saint who surprises, or maybe all of the ones I just talked about, then we might ask who among ourselves, who among us in our congregation and out there in the world Who among us are those who have been left on the margin, who have been ruled out of bounds, who might surprise us by their generosity and faith, and who just want to see Jesus, but they've been kept at bay? If we are willing to ask and dare answer such questions, we might see both Zacchaeus and Jesus in a whole new light. Two ways of seeing the story of Zacchaeus. A sinner in need of repentance. A saint who surprises us. And a Jesus who moves towards Zacchaeus and affirms him in relationship. Too often we are like the crowd who sees Zacchaeus as a sinner in need of repentance. Church is meant to be a safe space where people, all people, can experience uplifting social interaction with God and with each other. Yes? The story of Zacchaeus is not about him repenting, but it is about the crowd who pushed him to the margins of social interactions in order to maintain the status quo. The story is not about him, it's about us. The story is, in fact, not about us. It's about Jesus and what Jesus does. So like with the experiment with the rats and heroin, when people are pushed to the margins, they are alone and lonely and branded as in need of help, but nobody seeing them in their isolation and inviting them to come down, I'm going to go to your house today. No wonder they then turn to substances and other things that can help them numb their pain. If the story of Zacchaeus teaches us something, it is that they are not the problem. We often are. If the story of Zacchaeus teaches us something, it is that we, friends, should be like Jesus, who seeks people out and have table fellowship with them. We often put the burden on the other to seek us out. But Jesus and Zacchaeus look for each other. But it is Jesus, our Jesus, who stops, looks up, and invites and goes to table with Zacchaeus. May we do the same and not point to sinners in need of repentance, but to saints who surprise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.